it's the twentieth year in a row. Well, mm -hmm. you've been coming for thirty years. Yes, this is actually my thirty-first year. Thirty thirty years as a member. The first time I came with the government delegation here, then I became a member. But uh, the main thing is the Pakistan breakfast. Uh, this is the twentieth year, and uh, you know, really, for me, it's a, a big occasion because projecting Pakistan in a sea of uh, other countries. Mainly, you see India. I mean, you can see Tata here, and uh, you can see, uh, you know, Infosys, and you can see other <coughs> Indian states. So, to, to project Pakistan, for me, it, uh, it's been a great uh, a ch a challenge and an opportunity, and I think a great opportunity given to me uh, by Allah Almighty to project my own country. So, you would like to recall the first time when you told me that it was the Nawaz Sharif government. So, how was it introduced to you? No, 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 no. That uh, you know, I actually came with me and Nawaz Sharif, Mr. Sartaj Aziz, and all. They were holding an investment conference in uh, Zurich. Uh, it was very well attended. And after that, me and Nawaz Sharif asked uh, Arif Nizami and myself. That we are going up to a place called Davos. Come along. Me and I mean, we had never heard of uh, actual Davos at that time, and so we were a little reluctant. But because Mr. Sataj is uh, was insistent, <coughs> we said, "Okay, we'll come." So uh, there were a group, a lot of uh, media personalities, but we, two of us were singled out. We came here. In fact, we stayed in a very small hotel called Oaks, and I still remember. And uh, uh, then. Uh, We were here, and during that process, while we were in the Congress Center, um, you know, totally by chance, I was having coffee there, and this lady came up to me. The, the chairman's uh, office at that time very small, called Shaw, and very turn. He, the lady, came out and said, uh, "Where are you from?" I said, "Pakistan." He said, "Can I have a cup of coffee with you?" I said, "Sure." She said, "I'm the executive secretary too." The chairman, you know, Mr. Koshop. I said, I, in fact, I had just heard of him there only. So he, she asked. He says, I was wearing a media badge. Mm -hmm. So we talked about Pakistan, the media generally. The next day, I came back, same down. She came up to me and she said, you should not be wearing a wrong badge. I said, why? He said, you are a media badge. I said, yes, but I, I write regularly. For the nation, and the editor also is here. He said, "She said, no, uh, you're a businessman, and uh, you know you should have a white badge, which is a businessman." I said, "I, I don't, I don't know about that." Anyway, again we talked about business and my writing and weekly columns. She went away. The third day, again, you know, I was passing by and she stopped me. She said, "Mr." Uh, Dr. Kloshov wants to see you. So I said, <laughs> I think you know this infrared that media badge. You know I shouldn't have had the media badge. Dr. Kloshov said, "You are very interesting. You are the only businessman I know in the world of some stature who writes a weekly column." And uh, I said, "I didn't know that." He says, "Well, I it's my business to know." So would you like to be, become a member of the World Economic Forum? I said, "What does it take?" He says, "But it is by invitation only, and uh, presently it will cost you to become a member. It will cost you twenty uh, thousand uh, Swiss francs, and uh, moreover, if you uh, 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 want to attend the things re regularly, then whatever the annual charges is, you'll have to give, and of course your hotel and all." I said, I think I should be able to do that. So I became a member. He uh, uh, waved the waiver. At that point, their thing was that the turnover must be hundred million dollars. I was hardly a million dollars turnover at that time in the security and management services company, you know. So he waved that, and he said, "That's why I became a member." So I became a member '94. I kept seeing India shining, India this, India that, for ten years. I said, "Why aren't we doing something?" I asked the others. Uh, I didn't like name them. I said, "Why don't we do get together, do something?" 
नहीं नहीं बड़े पैसे लगते हैं ये है वो मैं बोला कि फाइन लेट मी सी वॉट आई कैन अफोर्ड सेवेंट राउंड आस्ट वॉट इट टेक्स टू हैव अ ब्रेक हैव अ ब्रेकफस्ट एंड ऑल देन देन आई वेंट टू जल मुशरफ एंड यू नो जल मुशरफ माई सेल्फ सर्व द आर्मी टूगेदर ही वॉज अ गुड फ्रेंड So I told him, I said, I want to take you something called World Economic Forum. He says, What's that? He says, I said, Well, only when you go there, find out. He says, Chalo, tumare kya ne pa chalta hu. So he came here. I booked the Stegen Burger for 150 people. 250 came to that room. He was a sellout, and uh, that sellout, you know, as a sellout, he uh, everybody came. Whether it was Bill Gates, whether it was Jeff Bezos, whether it was, uh, you know, Richard Branson, you know, everybody. I mean, it was sight to be seen. Every one of the people came. Right? It was such a great thing for Pakistan. That was what you know. Uh, I could not believe it. 2003. That, uh, and he was very good. He spoke uh, very well. And therefore, you know, till uh, he he came again in 2005 and 2007. Shock of disease came in 2004 and 2006, and then after that uh, we had uh, Mia Nawashri uh, here uh, twice. We had uh, Yusuf Raza Gilani, the PPP. We had uh, in between uh, there was you know no traction, so I Imran Khan was I got Imran Khan. Uh, in fact, the World Economic Forum asked me why are you getting a sportsman in. I said he just might, he just might be your future Prime Minister of Pakistan. Actually, this is a 2010 or 11. So they said, "Okay, fine, we'll uh, you host him." So we hosted him uh, for the first time, 2011. Then, of course, we had uh, uh, you know Mia Nawaz Sharif again. Then we had uh, 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 Shahid Hakan Abbasi. We had General Rahil Sharif right. here. Uh, we, you know, uh, I mean, we had Bilawal Bhutto here. We, the thing is, so. We we didn't look at any particular political party. We just said Pakistan, we are Pakistan. And you believe me, every one of the Pakistani leaders did not talk about the uh, their you know their dirty linen of Pakistan. They talked about Pakistan only. We questioned them. Here we are all Pakistan, and uh, they went and. Uh, uh, we uh, stayed with that uh, particular theme and we did very well we we we've never had less than we've never never had except for one year when uh, the pr- prime minister had to go away no actually at in one of the uh, this thing because saudi king had died uh, when we had less than 200 people we've never had less than 200 people in a room that fits only on 150 so that by itself shows how much of uh, interest there was you know in pakistan at that time and we want to revive keep that interest going right. you know and uh, this time i'm very grateful uh, to uh, uh, anwar hakakar that he is coming uh, let's see he was here by the way in 2018 uh, when jam kamal came uh, as one of the speakers so uh, as the chief minister of balochistan and he did uh, one or two sessions which is very good so i thought i said why, why don't you uh, come in your own right now and he very readily accepted and so we've got him here inshallah we'll be doing the pakistan breakfast tomorrow uh, hopefully he'll be there and our agenda is really simple pakistan and pakistan alone you know i don't care damn uh, you know whether what political party to me political party ho oh, i mean we had general rahil shreef here from the army General Rishi was brilliant. Out of 200 speakers, in the uh, the the poll that they take afterwards, he was rated fifth. Out of 200 speakers, he was rated fifth. But can you imagine? You know, even uh, it was it was a, it was a very uh, it was a moment of great pride for me. So, so, where do you think Pakistan is? Where where we where are we in our journey? So, Actually, we got mixed up in our journey somewhere. and we got mixed in a journey because we do not face facts right you know I, i've been saying this for a long time i'm one of the people people who really believe in democracy 
and I believe in uh, proper grassroots democracy. I have been saying that unless you have local bodies elections, you cannot have proper democracy, right? And I have also been saying that if you want uh, to uh, uh, really have uh, representation of the people, anybody who stands for provincial assembly or national assembly must have first qualified for the local bodies. If he doesn't have a route somewhere, yeah, he just the, the, the uh, uh, provincial assembly or national assembly is just a debating club, which it is now. I mean, you hardly see you somebody comes in, passes one ordinance, changes the ordinance. I'm not uh, um, that thing, but I think it requires a little bit. We, we cannot become uh, uh, hidebound by the British rules and things like that. We have to think out of the box. We are a South Asian country. We've got to do one thing. Number two, let me be very clear about it. You see, and that is where we go wrong. That is why you have army inter interventions. You have to accept that the army has a role in Pakistan. Now, that army has a role in Pakistan is not in governance, right? But the point is that its role must be recognized as a corrective course so without intervening. You know, I, I, army has, cannot run the country. It, it is the civil uh, elected people and, and the civil bureaucracy that can run the country. But the army has a role to it. I have been saying this time and again. I said Pakistan is because the Pakistan ar army is. The Pakistan army is because the chief of army staff is. The chief of army staff, I may like him, I may dislike him. I may like his views, I may dislike his views. But he is the chief of army staff. We cannot afford to say or do anything that denigrates his position, that undermines the authority that he wields. Right? That he, we have to accept it. And then he has come across a process that is very exacting. You know, he's gone to a captain major promotion exam. He's gone through the staff college. Right? He's done his National Defense University. He's gone abroad for studies. The all chiefs of army staff, more or less, have done that. They commanded a division, commanded a corps. Right? So he's gone through a process. So he's, he's been tested already. So, you know, all right, he may like you more or you may like him more. But you have to accept his thoughts. Right? Don't undermine him. Right? But on the other hand, the army must remember that yes, they can do course correction wherever they feel that the national security of Pakistan is endangered. And that can be in external, internally, it can be due to economy, it can be due to water security, anything. Then they should quietly, and they, they do. The national security council must be made more effective. Right? So, I think that is the problem. We cannot define the role. We've, we've become, we've just made it into a British Parliament. Oh, come on, for God's sake, that's, even the British Parliament has become a joke, you know. So now it's time to get, get beyond the British Parliament, to get beyond, beyond this, uh, you know, Section 1, Section 3, 1, 62, 1 applies to you, 60, that does not apply to you, Number one. Number three, let us not be hypocrites. Let's not be hypocrites. He says, people sitting in the Supreme Court do not realize what's going on outside. It is the job of the Supreme Court to maintain that discipline. But they have to do it in a fair ground, not in a way that uh, really goes in a way that, you know, people get a brand of that thing. You may or may not like uh, Imran Khan. You may or may not like, uh, you know, what his wife does, right? I don't, I don't like it, right? But I like Imran. But so what? I like Mian Ashraf. I like uh, Bilawal Barzadari. Right? So, what different? I like, by the way, I like Chaudhary Shujavisan very much. Right? He's been always been very nice to me. And, right? He's got his own idiosyncrasies. So, let's be the, and let us put it, Marana, Sirajul Haq and Jamaat Islami. Can you discount them? They've always stood on principles. Right? right? Look at uh, Naima Rahman in, in Karachi. Right? Stood on principles. So, let's go with it. Let's, let's get this thing sorted out. Let's not be hypocrite. This is the army role. I think the army role comes in accountability. If they, they give a proper role in accountability, right, and don't have these uh, uh, judges, somebody taking off hair, somebody going sick, somebody uh, uh, after two years uh, 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 remembering God and coming out with the truth. <laughs> you know?
I just want to speak about that whole, you know, army. Mm. Speaking to somebody a few days ago, mm. they were saying the world has really changed. Yeah. None of the old school economics that we were taught mm. now works. Mm. Even for countries, in Pakistan's case, he said that if Pakistan can sell chawal to certain countries, they will take India through it. Mm. And that's what... Because it's for you, because your is so bureaucratic, आगे जी प्रॉब्लम ये जो आपकी सबसे जबरदस्त चीज जो की है और फॉल्ट ने की है ये स्पेशल इन्वेस्टमेंट फ्रस्ट्रेशन काउंसिल ऑफ कोर्स वी आर प्रोजेक्टिंग देम हियर राइट आई हैव नो प्रोजेक्ट विद देम आई एम प्रोजेक्टिंग देम हियर बिकॉज़ दे हैव कट अक्रॉस ऑन द रेड टेप दे मेड इट इजीयर फॉर द बिजनेसमैन द बिजनेसमैन कैन गो एंड से ओके हियर इज व्हाट वी आर व्हाट टू डू दैट इज व्हाट इज रिक्वायर्ड इफ यू मेक इट इजीयर फॉर द बिजनेसमैन he will uh, do for us and i tell you you know what we've done in it do you think india can beat us in what we've done right if the whole uh, if the world economic forum is projecting us the world economic forum is a pakistan success story yeah. right so you have this so how would you describe the relevance of pakistan in this day and age are we still relevant to the world without pakistan this whole region would be in chaos anybody looks at the map look at pakistan it is in the interest of everyone west the chinese whoever you even india to make sure that pakistan is a stable country india is being very short sighted about this if pakistan descends into chaos right india will have such turmoil that you can never even think about we have india has far more fishes than we have and india has 80 million brahmins and 200 200 million other people approximately 400 billion ruling 700 million people dalits the tribals the christians the muslims right right this is one minority ruling on vast majority and calling themselves a hindu kingdom they're not a secular country by any chance right This is not that thing. These are the characters. I mean, the greatest hypocrite was Mr. Modi, taking the ministers, to world leaders to Gandhi's, uh, you know, where's Mausoleum, right? They are the guys who killed Gandhi, right? And Modi is part, was part of that. Uh, I mean, not the RSS is very much part of BJP, in one way or the other, right? So let's be very frank about it. We, we, if we go into turmoil. The entire region will go into turmoil. Entire region, whether it be Middle East, whether it be um, India, etc., right? All of it will go into turmoil. So it's the interest of everyone to keep us stable and correct and that thing. So let's not that thing. And I tell you, that national security talking about the Pakistan army is the best guarantee of that. Let's not forget it. That okay, no business running the country. And I, I tell them all the time. You read my articles. So don't run the country, run the people who run the country. <laughs> Thank you for addressing the relevance, right, sir. <laughs> Now coming to India, hmm. we expect, and it's all, uh, it's set on the timeline that India will soon take over China as the world's largest country. It will not start with. Let me be very clear about it. It will not. Whatever the West may does, it cannot. Right? India has got a lot of problems. I mean, You see, Modi has got away with it, and, right? And also, the businessmen have supported Modi and all that. But, but the Chinese have gone into a different sphere as far as India is concerned. They cannot, right? And then, very frankly speaking, they're telling lies as far as Ladakh is concerned. The Chinese are occupying all the high ground in Ladakh, and the Indians are just not publicly proclaim it just for their own purposes. You see, Modi, you know, it's like Pakistan. He, the You know the strikes, the build on the strikes. The Indian public doesn't know, you know, that we hit six places, and without causing a single casualty. Why? Because we wanted to tell them that we can do this, right? So that was some capability. So you know, let's be uh, frank about it. And let's be frank about it. India has got a lot to gain by ha having a stable Pakistan. We've got a lot to gain to have trade with India. There's no doubt about it. The bilateral trade with India help us uh, great. The bilateral Bangladesh, for example, we have complementary economies. 
we should have bilateral trade, we should have uh, this thing, etc. Jute and tea and uh, you know th things come from there, from here. Cotton, cotton textiles go, rice goes. Yeah. Yeah. I think we look at the relationship between India and Pakistan. We have to look at the relationship with India and India has to do that thing. So we don't say hand over Kashmir to us, the thing they should, they're never going to do it. We've got, we've got some arrangement over Kashmir, you know, maybe free borders like Musharraf was dying, you know. That I, uh, I was actually banned for some time in the National uh, Defense University for suggesting this. But um, uh, within six months, Musharraf had adopted that and given that as his proposal to India and it was working. Soft borders, trade had started, this, that. And eventually it, it led to, you know, maybe orange passes and green passes where Kashmiris could have visit each other across the border, right, etc. And then as the tensions would have eased down, things would have picked up and trade. We, we, we very much need trade with India. We very much need trade with India, but we cannot do it on Indian terms. And what are, because of that, what is happening? Right, because of that, the Indians don't have access uh, to the whole world by road and rail, right? Because we are there and they don't allow us the through to Bangladesh or Burma, etc. Why should we allow them access this side? And you know, they, 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 and so and we have to be very pragmatic about it. I agree. We have to come to some arrangement. And the, and the Indians have to understand that, that at the end of the day, that you, know, you cannot take away uh, uh, that India is a big country. It's not take away the way it's a big economy, etc. Okay, fine. They have to learn to live with their neighbors. They cannot, uh, you know, Bangladesh and Nepal and and Sri Lanka and Maldives and hope to get away with it all the time. You think people in Bangladesh love them? You think people in Nepal love them? You think people in Sri Lanka love them? Let me tell you more. Pakistanis don't hate Indians so much as much as these people do. Yes, yeah. So now let's talk about Pakistani people. Hmm. You know, they say for any democracy to thrive, you can't really rely on courts because if courts get, everyone starts taking their cases to the court, court will run out of time and space. So eventually it comes down to the integrity of individuals. So for Pakistani people, how important is it, you think, for us or for people in power, people who are in, in let's say, in powerful positions to start educating people and what's the need for our people to also realize... Mansur. What you're talking about is theoretical. What I'm going to suggest is practical. And I say to you that the vast majority of the Pakistan armed forces retires around the age of 45, whether they be officers or not. Right? Don't retire them. Don't put them out. Right? Only retire those people who want to be retired. People who want to stay in service, transfer them. Transfer them to what is known as homeland security. And from homeland security, give them to the judiciary, Give them to the uh, uh, law enforcement agencies, police. Give them to the um, uh, 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 paramilitary forces like uh, rangers and uh, court. Give them to uh, medical testing, etc. Use the trained manpower, right? Don't retire them. That do the trained manpower. Now, to give an example, I just want to give a small example. Every major when he retires, he's done his came to major post exam. He's done his military law. He just takes six months more in, in a judicial academy before retiring to become a magistrate. Can you imagine that if you had magistrates around the clock in the police stations, most of the cases would be decided in the police stations, right? And can you imagine that the SHO would not have such arbitrary powers that he has now, right? And can you imagine what a change would bring about the law enforcement agencies? Right? Don't let the police have the thing. But Stop the recruitment at the lower level. Bring your trained manpower into the police. Take your trained manpower into the uh, frontier corps, into the rangers. Take your trained manpower. Do not that thing. So stop this pension bomb also. You already got a financial problem. This is very separate. But you have to, so don't talk practical. You're going to educate them. You're going to do that. Make it happen. You have the manpower available to you. You're the thing. You know. I have a private security company. I have. 500 um, uh, uh, requests every time they retire, you know, so many 500 requests a year of majors saying that thing. I can hardly accommodate a few of them. But it doesn't look good. How many people can accommodate like that? Then they are trained manpower. They can be used. Okay, so they don't ha uh, 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 affect the promotion the judiciary. They don't affect the protection of the police. That's a formula that I don't know experts can work out. 
but don't allow your trained manpower. So don't don't talk about theoretical education. We will, we will have every government that comes and talks about that that doesn't get anywhere. You know. Awesome. So as a businessman in Pakistan or as a um, as a leader in your field, uh, I'm sure you've come across many situations where um, you know at the end you have to for lack of a better word, compromise or come to terms on certain situations. My question here specifically is that how difficult it is at times to say sorry or to say, okay, this was a learning. Because when you look at uh, uh, a lot of these people in this world, a lot of unlearning is happening. And they say one of the things that sort of blocks unlearning is also people's own mind. So as, as a senior business leader, uh, how would you advise young business leaders in life as you navigate through such Never, never, never hesitate to cut your losses. My father taught me one thing very clearly, never reinforce failures. I've, I've had a lot of failures. I've had businesses that have never taken off. I've never taken off for various reasons. Maybe my managers were inept. I chose the wrong people to lead them. Like I had a company that went bankrupt. And the person who was trying to was trying to sell it off. You know, and I, the last minute, he was, I said, how can you sell this company off when you know it's not working, right? No, no, sir, it's all right. You're getting 20 crores. What, are you, what is wrong with you? You know, I said, you have to be there. You have to make sure. You have to be sincere. You know, I, I had a very good speech by Hussain Daud the other day, you know, you know, in which, you know, he talked about sincerity. He talked about truthfulness. You have to be truthful to yourself first. You know, and then decide how truthful you can be to others. <laughs> <laughs> so, because, that's a good one. And so, one more thing about personally as a Gram Cycle, you've been doing this for so long and you've been committed. Uh, how would you like the next couple of years to turn out to Pakistan? Well, I, I would like my son to continue this. You know, I'm 78 and as you were coming up, you know, I got dizzy a little bit. You people had me. You know. I'm Muslim. If one day death will come, you know, it will come unexpectedly. I hope it comes peacefully. But one has to pass on to the next generation. I think I've built up my son. He's done well. And I've built up a lot of people. You interacted with a lot of people in my group, in my company. You know, so there are two CEOs here. And you, you saw them, they were loading steel stands with their own hands. You know, so, you know, that is the Pakistani character. The, the Pakistan has the best workforce in the world. Whether it's the labor class, whether it's the skilled force, best. You just have to give them the leadership. Today we stand here, just imagine, where are you people going to go after this? Right? You're going to go and see the cradle of Islam in Europe. Huh? That is Spain and Portugal. Right? That is the thing we've given them as a reward for what they have done all the whole year. The selected people, some of them are hardcore, of course, they get to go, but they're hardworking people. And uh, that thing I said, I hope my son carries this tradition on. Right? I hope they will. Any words on leadership, sir? One can learn a lot. Leadership, get your own character first, correct. Once your own character and integrity is correct, any leadership is possible in the world. Amazing. Yeah. So, any last words, anything that you'd like to speak about that we haven't asked? Yes. I'd like to speak to the leaders of Pakistan, whichever party they belong to. Don't waste time insulting each other. Use your time to tell us what you can do for the nation and please do it.